Macarion to Stokes, who's onside. Wow! Hello and welcome. It is episode 71 of the Saints FC podcast and I'm joined by my old friend Tom Parker. Tom, how the devil are you? I'm in a really good mood, John. How are you? Yeah, great. I'm really pleased that you're in a really good mood. This is fantastic. I mean, there's there's lots of new stuff happening in your life. Um, I don't know if you want to share that with the podcast listeners or not. You, you don't, don't, don't feel obliged to. But you know what yeah, I was thinking? No, I'm a... Go on, John. I, what I was thinking, just as we were listening to that little intro there, wouldn't it be so good if kind of round about this time next week, I'm kind of scrambling to get some new commentary into our intro of some sort of famous goal or victory in, in some match that might happen between now and next Wednesday? Definitely going to be a Shay Adams commentary for me. Is, is, is that, is that gonna what it's going to be? Yeah, you ain't. He's gonna. We'll we'll talk about this week, but I've got no doubt he's gonna hit the ground running on Friday, and he's gonna carry that into Tuesday like a treat. Yeah, great. Um, we will get on to obviously the uh, the big South Coast derby, um, and the other. Uh, is it a derby? I don't know. Maybe we'll even have that question. <laughs> um, is it for Bournemouth? Yeah, I, I think it's a derby for for Bournemouth. Maybe not not so much. Um, not so much for us. But anyway, screw all that. We're going to call this the South Coast Derby special episode in terms of preview anyway. But before we get into all of our South Coast rivalries, Tom, um, I think we need to talk about um, your hypnobirthing course. Yeah, solid uh, five hours of hypnobirthing today, John. Very interesting uh, for any uh, Saints fans either expecting their first child or their partners expecting or any child. Uh, it's very, very interesting. You know, did, did you say five all hours? That mind over matter. So this was yeah, we did. We're doing call split two. Yeah. Uh, today the first part last is five hours, and it's all about you know how with positive uh, suggestions and positive wording and meditation and support, you can help your partner have a really positive. Um, hopefully pain-free birthing experience um, because I've never given birth um, but quite frankly it's terrifying so anything you can do to make that better for your significant other is, is I, th- I think one of the the key things about this sort of stuff is that it gives you something to do as the partner because <laughs> you know when your wife or significant other is there like you know clenching fists screaming blue murder or whatever it is that they're doing um it's nice to have something to do where you can feel like you have a positive impact although there is one thing i would um steer clear of i think in the hypnobirthing say oh yeah you you can use like music that familiar with and will chill you out chances are your wife won't ever want to listen to that again so just don't ruin any albums but um (laughs) for for us like klf chill out album that's just a me thing. Sophie won't listen to it anymore. So, just too uh, too traumatized by it. Yeah, exactly. Like, just... a Viet- like a Vietnam veteran. Like. Yeah. Um. Anyway, I suppose that little chat there is for Sarah, who emailed in um after we last spoke on to say that she enjoyed our hypnobirthing chat, along with all of well, the Saints chat. So, well, there's more to come. Cause more hypnobirthing <laughs> on the horizon. So, don't. You know, <laughs> we can start a separate hypnobirthing podcast. It'll be a big hit. Yeah, two blokes talking about hypnobirthing. It's, it's going to be a winner, isn't it? Um, well, I thought w- women love that, being talked to by yeah. men about things that everybody really understands. So, yeah, it'll be a big hit. Um, anyway, a, a little shout out to Sarah who, who emailed in. Um, she said that uh, she used to be taken to the Dell back in the 1980s. 1981 was her first game during the Keegan era, and she's been hooked since. Um, and she now gets to take, you know, her, her children to the games as well, which is which is great. 
I love seeing that kind of continuation of Saints family and Saints fans. So big hello to Sarah. Thank you very much for emailing in. If you'd like to email in and talk about hypnobirthing or even Southampton Football Club, uh, you can do so, saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. Tom, should we, get on, should we get on to the main business? Let's crack on, John. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I asked about the hypnobirthing is I thought that the reason you were doing that was why you couldn't watch the Saints Sheffield United game, but you managed to watch it in the end. Yeah, no, so I so I've got a couple of so I was in Winchester at the weekend. Uh, uh, beautiful Winchester. If anyone's not been to Winchester, I'd strongly urge you to go. So I thought I had him the this weekend so I actually had a trip to Winchester with my wife uh, for a weekend away. Um Winchester is really beautiful. Uh, I imagine lots of Saints fans listening to this from Southampton, from Hampshire, have been to Winchester. It's actually the first time I've ever been. John, have you been to Winchester? Uh, I have. Do you want to know the story behind it? It's a little bit amazing. Please tell me. So um, I was at Southampton Uni, obviously chose my university based on the football club that I supported. <clears throat> and then there was one night when the Winchester Art College were having their kind of like end of year party in the Southampton Students' Union because the, the college is linked, the arts college is linked to the, to the university. And I was in there earlier in the day and when it came to kicking out time, I somehow managed to avoid getting kicked out and went onto the dance floor. And the great thing about Winchester Art College is that I think the female to male ratio was about six to one. And although I am a bit of a stud, Tom, uh, I didn't always get 100% female attention at the drop of a hat um, at uni. Apart from this one occasion when I walked onto the dance floor um, where the Winchester art students were there and immediately two girls kind of came up and started dancing with me and I went back to my house told my housemates um there were seven boys living in the house and I was like oh my god this is amazing this is what happened and then you never guess what we did the next weekend (laughs) we went up to Winchester and we had absolutely no success whatsoever it was it was it was dreadful but um you know there, there we go so um Anyway, I'm a much more sensible and much more rounded, well-behaved human being these days. So, uh, yeah, F- forgive me that. That was what I was like when I was in my early 20s. Well, if you can't do that when you're in your early 20s, when, when can you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, great. So we can talk about the St. Sheffield United game, which was, it was actually, I mean, I had <laughs> some people calling it kind of like a lucky away result. Some calling it a scrappy away result. But actually... It was a bit of a humdinger of a game. It was pretty end-to-end stuff. And there was good quality and bad quality and scrappy quality on both sides the whole way through the game. Yeah, I, I, thought, it was a, I thought it was a really good game. Um, it, it kind of, it reminds you of everything that's really good about the Premier League. I think we've said this before um, with games with Saints where, you know, two teams that really sort of snap into each other uh, from the get-go. Uh, it was a really, really good game, and it does kind of show the bias. I think a bit in this, or I mean, it's a, we will know if this looks on the match of the day. Thing, you know, so that game had a that game had a fairly contentious disallowed goal. It had a very good penalty shout. It had a straight red. It had an excellent solo goal. You know, it had all the makings of a really good game, and it was second to last on match of the day. Yeah, and it was after a Man United Leicester game where the winning goal was a penalty and nothing of significance happened at all apart from Harry Maguire getting booed. And I thought it was a really... I thought St. Shepard's right. Both teams came out with, with a lot of credit. Um, and I think there, but for the grace of, you know, David McGoldrick's finishing, Saints would have been in trouble. But I thought it was a really good game. Yeah, I, know, I suppose you could kind of say um, maybe from Henderson's keeping as, as well for Sheffield United because he had... Um, a couple of great saves as well. Right, l- well, let's try and do this a bit more justice than Match of the Day did. If we start from the beginning, I thought the first really significant thing of interest for Saints fans anyway was that Shea Adam shot, which pinged back off the post. A- and mm. this was a little bit of a window into the quality of the striker that we've signed because it was a really good shot, really well taken, and just unfortunate that it came back off the post and didn't go into the bottom corner of the net. Yeah, I've never been less worried about a striker not scoring goals than I'm not worried about Shea Adams not scoring goals. Does that make sense? Um, he like he seems to do so much right, and he seems to be so integral to the way that Ralph wants to play. And it's fascinating that Ralph 
you know, obviously wanted him in January because he knew this guy could play the game. You know, probably play the game that Ralph wants to play, probably better than any forward we've actually got. And uh, he was so unlucky. And I think, um, and, and John, I just want to say as well, Carl Anker, if you're listening, I thought there was a brilliant podcast you did with, with Carl. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And if you haven't listened to it, Fat Saints fans, you've got to go back and listen to it. It's a real fantastic bit of, uh, bit of uh, podcasting. But I think he was talking about um, uh, the, the sort of practice that James Beattie did with um, did the Shea Adams and yeah. about sort of bringing sort of different types of shooting into Shea Adams' game. But it was a fantastic shot and he was so, so unlucky for it to hit the post. Yeah, it... You know what? There were a little bit of shades of James Beattie with that, you know, that shot from the edge of the area, power, accuracy. Um, really good. You know, um, I, I suppose the other thing, though, <clears throat> as well as that being a great shot, and yeah, I, I, I'm not worried about Shea Adams. I know he's going to get his goal soon enough, um, is that sometimes when Saints do things positively, they then fall asleep, which we did for the next 10 seconds and nearly got punished. And had it not been for Angus Gunn, who thankfully wasn't asleep, making a really good save from the counter-attack. Yeah, it was almost such a good shot that it set up a counter-attack. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right, Saints fell asleep. And I think there was a few, you know, the defensive, it wasn't the best game for the defences, I think it's probably safe to say. Um, and I think, you know, Saints were just torn wide open by a relatively simple Sheffield United move for that counter-attack and you know, hats off to Angus Gunn for you know, what's that now that's sort of the sort of third or fourth game in a row where he's made really really vital saves and I think um, yeah, it was a good save it was a save he should never really have, have made because you know McGoldrick had the whole goal to aim at and all the time in the world um, but I think you know maybe we'll come to this but the Vestergaard what sort of went from hero against May United Kind of maybe not zero, but certainly suboptimal. Yeah, he, he, he reverted to the Vestergaard that we've seen more frequently than the Vestergaard we saw against Man United. Um, and he just wasn't, yeah, he just wasn't present enough. Um, mm. And also, I think, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about this game, we kind of have to talk about Ralph's kind of, yeah, we have all faith in Ralph and we don't want to question him, but it's kind of a bizarre formation that we started that game with Ginepa at left wing back and then. Sort of Vestergaard alongside him, and that was our weak spot, wasn't it? They just, you know, Sheffield United relentlessly targeted that that space, and with Jeffo definitely not being a left wing back, and Vestergaard seemingly having again reverted to type, uh, it was definitely a weak spot, and that, you know, it's no surprise that's where the pass was there from the Goldricks. Uh, brilliant chance came from. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder with the back line, I think we are better with the. Almost with the back four now, but then if the back four doesn't have the right personnel, it's it, I I don't know. Maybe it's the chopping and changing which is confusing. But yeah, Gineppo is definitely not a wing back, and um, I think Vestergaard looks more assured as part of a four. I think he knows what he's doing a bit more as part of a four. Um, not entirely convinced by my statement there. I, I, I'm even doubting myself as yeah, I say yeah, it. Yeah, you don't you don't sound like you really believe that. Don't <laughs> I have to say. Sorry to call you out on it. But he's a funny, I mean, like, he just sort of went back to that kind of very nervous, very ponderous, you know, he misjudged a few balls in the air like Burnley uh, all over again. And it was just very, um, he kind of got away with it. You know, he really did. But that, but it goes to show, I think, other teams are going to look at that and they're going to, you know, because they know he's probably going to start. So they're just going to relentlessly target him with balls over the top. Yeah. Um, let's hope people aren't doing this counting, but they probably are. Um should we get back on to the kind of more positive stuff? Because I want to talk about yeah, Chad Adams' header, which I thought was even better than his shot, which came off the post. He headed it perfectly, didn't he? He headed it down, he headed it, you know, away from the goalkeeper. And if that's, it, that's what they tell you to do, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Henderson's save, I mean, it wasn't quite Gordon Banks, but it was pretty bloody good. You know, he scooped it back out from what looked like a, a nailed-on goal. They think this kid is the sort of long term. They think Man United see him as sort of the long term successor to De Gea. Oh really? Um, yeah, he's England under twenty one. He's on loan for Man United. I think he won those sort of Golden Gloves last year in the Championship. He's a really really good keeper. And it, like you say, John, it was it was it was a, there was a couple of really good things about it. It was a really great header. It was a really great cross as well from Walprouse. The yeah. sort of cross we don't really see enough from James Walprouse. 
Um, it was a really, really good header. It was a great save. And then there was a brilliant sort of last-ditch tackle from a Sheffield United player, Scott Hoiberg, at the, at sort of on the post. You know, it had sort of four really good bits in it. That sort of just that few seconds of football. Um, and, and I think, you know, it kind of, again, it, it's another, it was a really good chance. It was a really, you know, it goes, kind of showed the passion and the sort of frenetic nature of the game. And, you know, I think you'd probably look at Shad and say, I think, you know, poor guy, what's he got to do? He can't buy a goal. Um, but he just keeps plugging away. Yeah, I, I, the, the goal's definitely coming, isn't it? Um, you know, and you, you've probably got to think that you look at Shea Adams and how he took his chances where he didn't really do anything wrong and he's just ended up on the bad side of luck. Whereas you look at David McGoldrick's chances and that one that he shot over from three yards out, which was, was the the next chance in the match, really. He looks more like a striker who can't buy a goal. I think Shea Adams' goal is coming. I'm not so sure about David McGoldrick. Yeah, and I think, and we'll, we'll come to this, but... Um, you know, Shadam seems to bring so much to that team, and we'll talk about it when we get to the goal, um, uh, where, where Shea gets sort of an assist. Uh, but like, he he seems to, what we almost need is just something to hit him, you know, like uh, Danny Ings is going to Liverpool. Just need something to go in. Because mm-hmm. I've got no doubt when they start going in, they're going to they're gonna fly in. Um, but yeah, I think it was a, a really good header, but, you know, what can, it, what can you do? Goalkeeper was that world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can't do much about that. Um, th- throughout the rest of the half, I, I think one of the things that I, I noticed is that we were definitely trying this Ralph Hasenhutl ta- tactic of trying to win the ball high up the pitch and get a goal within 10 seconds. I mean, Gineppo won a ball back from a, a scuffed shot, um, which, which kind of led to a scuffed shot from Buffal. Um, and we saw that kind of mm. happening in the second half as well. And Buffal even getting involved in some of the, the kind of tackling high up the pitch. So that was all looking really good. The one thing that I was a bit worried about, though, is that we're still looking very susceptible from set pieces, um, as I suppose demonstrated by the McBurney disallowed goal. Bear in Shepherd and I did exactly the same thing in the first half. Do you remember towards the end of the first yeah. half, the Cole did a really juicy free kick, and the guy kind of skied it. And it was very similar. You know, it kind of evades all the defenders, and I think... VAR, I was very cynical of, but as a Saints fan now, we've seen, I think, John, correct me if I'm wrong, three goals against Saints disallowed due to VAR. Um, so so you know, the, this one at the weekend, the one against Brighton, what's the other one, Tom? I don't know someone, that, I read that it was three now, but I couldn't think of the third. So perhaps it is only two. Was there one and in those, the game against Fulham, perhaps? I didn't watch that one. Uh, I don't know. Is there a bar in the League yeah. Cup? I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. But, I mean, if you think as well, that, that goal against Brighton, the terrifying thing about the goal against the, the goal for Brighton against Saints was, even though it was the most obvious offside slash interior play ever, the linesman didn't give it. So the referee, and the referee blew up for, you know, blew up for it. And uh, the goal Shepherd United goal was, you know, would have been given, I yeah. think, without bar. You know, and that's, you know, we know the Saints have many strengths. Coming back from when they've conceded is not one of them. Definitely okay. not coming back to concede one to win. And, you know, thank God for VAR because it was a really close one thing that did show the value of, of the system because the guy was offside. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the linesman would never know to give it and the referee definitely wouldn't be able to give it. So, you know, thank God for VAR. Okay. Well, thank you, VAR, for saving our bacon <laughs> once again. Have we got to the point now where we get to talk about that absolute worldie of a goal now, Tom? Yeah, I do. I want to talk about the worldie of goal, and also I think we should talk about Buffal. Buffal yeah. turned into a really interesting player, but the goal, John, how good was this? Was probably the most exciting goal since Buffal against West Brom for me. It w- it was so good, and you know, it had the other. It, one of the things that the Buffal goal against West Brom had was the defender on the ass, and we had that oh, again that's with that's this a one. Great. Um, yeah. Although Gineppo only got one on his arse. I mean, Buffal had two players running into each other and ending up on their arse. Yeah. And that was really, like, really quite magical. Keystone Cops style uh, defending. But where does the goal start, John? How do we get the goal? Well, as what, what is 
Ralph's plan. It comes from Sheffield United playing the ball out. And is it Buffal winning the ball back? I mean, he said Che Adams. No, it's didn't che, it? Is it's it Che Adams. Adams? Yeah. Che Adams wins the ball back. He, yeah, he gets that ball off that midfielder yeah. and instantly you know, follows the game plan, which is to turn, you know, as you say, attack the goal within 10 seconds winning the ball. And Saints executed it perfectly. And also, you know, very intelligent sort of runs from Buffal and Adams to kind of just give uh, Gineppo just a little bit of space. But Gineppo gets the ball and he's getting fouled. But he doesn't go down, does he, John? He just kind of struggles on. the, the, The strength that he had to not go down under that pressure from Norwood and... You know, to to ride out that challenge was really really impressive, and this is one of the things that that Carl Anker was talking about on last week's episode of the podcast was Saints and the cynical fouls. Norwood was doing what a, a defensive midfielder or a midfielder in a defensive position should do: give away a cynical foul in a less dangerous position than the situation that you're currently in. And Gineppo, yeah, Gineppo just refused to let him do that, and and then once he got past it, and then facing two defenders. Quaking no, in their boots now. He, when he gets past him, he beats him again. Yeah, he does this weird like track back thing that I, that I don't quite understand why he, what the purpose was. Obviously, you know, he obviously felt he needed to do it. So he kind of gets past him, and then maybe he he felt that the where is it not where he was, he could maybe tackle him. So he sort of beats him again. Do you know what I mean? He kind of does this drag back to beat him mm. again, and then he goes on. He's got two men in front of him. What does he do, John? Well, he, he just kind of glides past them, doesn't he? He has the drop of the shoulder, sends them mentally and partially physically one way and then just moves it across to his right, herring down towards the, towards the penalty spot, I suppose, kind of that sort of part of the, the area, then a little bit past it, and then a sublime finish, Tom. That, I mean, that is the quality, isn't it? That's the difference. And oh, I like that. It's like one guy on his arm. And he makes one guy kind of give up. Yeah. There's like, like one guy just sort of looks and goes, like, well, I can't get there. Cause, and also because the bloke in front of that guy is now on his arm, so he's blocking the defender. And you're right. And it was such a brilliant... Yeah, in a, We've not seen a lot of... You know, we're not probably the most composed finishes in front of God. I, I don't think it's too controversial a statement to say. And um, and he just, you know, just sort of almost like passes it, you know, into the bottom corner of the goal, away from the keeper. And it was a brilliant, brilliant goal. And I, you know, in my hotel room in Winchester, I celebrate like a madman. <laughs> oh, mate. The, the thing about Gineppo is if he gets the ball in a dangerous position, he's only got one thing in his head, isn't it? You know, it's, it's like, I'm going yeah. to make this ball go into that onion sack. Um, and it's, it's just great to see someone with that kind of like direct... Um, I, I suppose attitude, but then also he's got the skill and the flair to do it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was a bit like when everyone said, "Oh, it's the new Mane," you know, and it's still a bit early, but obviously there's a sort of these lazy comparisons. Both young guys, both sort of smallish clubs that people have heard of but don't really know about. They're playing in leagues that no one watches football from, even if they know everything they do. You know, both from African countries where you know we don't know anything about the domestic game. But he does seem to sort of have that kind of combination of strength, steering pace, and ability to finish that um, the Saints, you know, you could argue Redmond has. But I think if we can get Gineppo sort of on all guns, I mean, you know, Friday night we play Bournemouth. So surely the game plan is like just give the ball to Gineppo. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about the prospect of seeing Gineppo firing on all cylinders, Redmond firing on all cylinders, Che Adams you know, with the confidence, with the goals behind him. And then, you know, you can then also pick a few out from, you know, Ings, um, from James Ward Prowse, from Buffal as well. That there's, there's goals in this Saints side. I mean, we haven't scored loads of goals yet, but we've scored, you know, we've, we've been on the right end of results and we have scored one or two. But I think there's, there's more coming, Tom, isn't there? I can feel it. Yeah, I, I feel like that that dam in Derby, you know, like I'm just about just to burst, to and it's just gonna, you know, there's gonna be a gushing of goals. Oh, you know, break goals, John. You know where it'd be a really good place for that to start happening. Front Park. <laughs> oh my God, mate! Can you imagine? 
Well, they, they lose 2 1 at home. I mean, you know, it's well too much, but they lost 2 1 at home today on Saturday to like, Newport or mm. someone like that. Yeah, they, they drew with Burton Albion, didn't they, earlier? Oh, that's, that's what, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I but I think, I mean, if we can touch briefly on, on Bufal, um, he's not scoring the goals yet, um, but my God, is he a nightmare. And also, I think one of the great things with Bufal is he's his skill. He seems to have sort of learned when is enough skill. Yeah, like previously, he's, I, I've been one to criticise him for sort of overplaying, you know, beat the player, and then he tries to beat him again, and then he probably loses it. Whereas now, one of the great things with uh, Boo is he's providing us a, almost like a, you'd expect like a big striker because mm. he he's holding the ball up and then using his skills to give other players the opportunity to make runs and to break and also just to alleviate the pressure on the defence a little bit. And in the last um, two games, uh, he's been a revelation. He was brilliant against Sheffield United and they just couldn't handle his skills. And I think it would be really interesting to see you know, what Ralph does in terms of when Redmond comes back. Because Redmond is undoubtedly his number one. But you could also argue that Buffer hasn't really done anything wrong in the game he's had. No, he, I, I've got a little bit of a theory about Buffer that I'm developing up and I'm going to air it here. And you, let me know what you think, Tom. Let you know. Let me know what you think, listeners, saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com if you want to get in contact. I think <clears throat> one of the things, one of the reasons why Buffer didn't work before was because under Puel and under especially under Pellegrino our build-up play was so slow and frustrating and we didn't have many attacks so if Buffon picked up the ball tried dribbling it past someone it didn't work and then got in a bit of a huff didn't track back or whatever it was really really frustrating and our attacks were so precious that you didn't want to see him wasting them by trying something that you know, was more likely not to come off than it was to come off. You know, so obviously it worked again in that wonderful goal against West Brom, but a lot of the time it just didn't go anywhere. Whereas under Ralph Hassenhutl, we're getting more chances and more attacks from the high press. And if someone's won the ball back through hustling uh, uh, Sheffield United or any or any of our opponents, defenders or you know defensive midfielders, and won the ball back, and then immediately we've got a chance. That's a that's a better opportunity for Buffal because the pl- the defending team are trying to work out all right what are we doing we're just changing our transition and they're kind of caught a little bit cold so it gives them a better opportunity for the attack and also as a fan watching you've almost got it almost feels a bit like you've got that attack for free you've got that attack from the hard work mm. from from your players so you're already pleased with the hard work because you've won the ball back unexpectedly and then you're kind of happy for the players to try something new. So Buffer and that sort of system is just much more palatable. And also I think he's going to get more chances and the chances are likely to be better. I think it's a really good point. I think, you know, we have that very low, laborious sort of style of play um, under Puel and under, you know, you're right where we sort of build up. You know, we try and build and then, you know, the defence, the opposition team just put sort of nine players behind the ball. And it becomes very, very difficult. I think you're absolutely right. Whereas now Bufal is sort of picking up the ball, defender is back. If he can hold on to that ball for a, a second or two, he's going to have at least three winning runners. You know, he's going to have both full backs that are going to bomb forward. He's going to have uh, Hoiberg that's there, plus his forward partners. And that, you're right, John. It gives him the kind of license just to, if he can get that ball out of his feet and away from the defender, he can, that attack can begin. Yeah. Whereas I think you're absolutely right with the previous sort of regimes, it was, you know, you know, it was absolutely right. Like, let's not take a risk. Whereas now we do seem to be able to take more risks. And um, with Ralph, we seem to have a manager that, you know, it's like compared to he's got the green edge, got stuffed out by the opposition. Like, Ralph seems to have sort of you know, got the number of, you know, Brighton and Sheffield United, he did a job on them. Man United, he did a job. Um, all right, let's call Burnley a freak result. No one gets anything against Liverpool. We, you know what? We came closer to getting a point out of Liverpool than anyone else has. So yeah, this season. yeah, yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right, Football. And I think that obviously he just needs a little bit of love. Yeah. Well, I mean, the kid, he's only 26 as well. 26 yeah. Yesterday, today. Oh, mate. I, I, I mean, I, I'm really excited about the Saints team. I, I just, I almost feel like the whole time we've been recording this podcast, Tom, this is the most excited I've been about Southampton. I think that's sort of fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, John, because also, 
you know that like we've got seven points, right? I think now is that seven, and we now go into that game. Like we go into the game on Friday, and we'll talk about the game. Like we can win that. We can't a third or something, fourth. Um, I think, if, right, it, I think if we season. win twelve nil, we're up to second, Tom. Yeah, I mean, it's only, <laughs> we will as well. But you know, it's only early in the season. Of course, it is. You're not getting ahead of ourselves because yeah. you're bad. But like, what it shows is we've got the manager and I think the squad to compete and to beat the teams that we because previously, you know, not only were we not being anyone or even taking points of anyone in the top six, we were struggling with the teams around us. You know, the teams that you kind of have to beat. The mm. Brighton, the Sheffield United, and now we're not. Like Saints seem to be able to go in those games, reasonably confident of getting a result. I mean, I still think the home form is the hoodoo. You know, it's still think yeah. we have an issue at St Mary's, um, but we can put that to bed on Friday. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so that was our third clean sheet uh, in three away wins, which is good. Um, do we want to have a little word on Billy Sharp, our ex-player? Yeah, it was a funny one, wasn't it? Because it kind of happened so quickly. Um, was it a red? Like Troy Deeney on Sky Sports News was saying, there's no way it's a red. And a lot of the ex-players that were talking about it said, there's no way it's a red. For me, like, it's very clever for Armstrong because Armstrong gets it away at his feet super quickly and kind of invites the challenge. Mm. But, but surely all these players, you know, before the start of the season, they sit down. And they sit there with the, the referee, you know, the people from the Premier League, the people from their own club who are experts, and they say, guys, look, this type of challenge, from this season on, this is a red card. Yeah. You know, if you go in with your feet high and you break down champagne, whether you hurt people or not, that's a red. It's going to be a straight red. And then they go and do it anyway. Um, for me, it was, it, was a sh- it, was, it was good for Saints because Billy Sharp was, was hurt left the guard on toast mm. uh, several times already and, and looked like if anyone was going to unlock Saints, it was definitely pretty sharp. He, 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 he was looking, him, he was looking sharper than um, David McGoldrick, wasn't he, if we're going to talk about the ex-Saints strikers? Yeah. I mean, well, also, he's so clever, isn't he? Yeah. Like, he used all that experience, all that skill. Until it know, comes to, to, to tackles exploit. where perhaps he's a little bit less clever. Anyway, yeah. I mean... I mean I, yeah, yeah I, I don't want to have any ill feeling towards... towards Towards Billy Sharp, no. really. Um, no, and and Saints fans sort of hacked him off as they're trying to do it. We're winning one nil, just four minutes to go, and we've been we're putting the rack a bit, and the bloke who's doing it just since then, off, so you can afford to clap, clap the pitch. Right, Tom. So let's move on to South Coast Derby Exhibit A. Is this a South Coast Derby? Saints versus Bournemouth on Friday. Thanks, no Bournemouth, yeah. <laughs> if that can be possible. Um, we'll move so on to like, Exhibit like, uh, B soon, but uh, what, what do we want to say like about this thing. game? I think it's a really exciting game for Saints, and I think it's going to be a real test for Saints because uh, Bournemouth will just, you know, go off and something that's a very odd Everton team who, despite spending all that money, can't still seem to get it right. Um, and Bournemouth have got, you know, Bournemouth are a club that historically that Saints seem to sort of not always lose against, but sort of struggle to win against, it's probably safe to say. Uh, both teams that like to play attacking, open football. I think it's going to be a really, really interesting, tough game for the Saints. But it's exactly the sort of game where, you know, if we can, if we can win, put ourselves on 10 points after, what, six games? Um, before a run of difficult games, but Chelsea, Wolves coming up. Um, it'll put us in great stead but I'm really excited about the game uh, and I think that you know I think you'll see I'm gonna, I don't want to make a predict do I want to make a prediction I think like 3-1 Saints and I do think Shea is going to score his first goal for Saints I think he'll get two Great well let, let's hope for that I mean Saints Bournemouth pretty evenly matched in the Premier League both played five both won two both drawn one both lost two both have a goal difference of minus one and both have seven points so you know, that says it should be a very evenly matched game. I think Eddie Howe is a really good manager. Ralph Hassan I think is a really good manager. Both play exciting football. Um, but Bournemouth have a pretty terrible record at St Mary's, so I'm probably with you, Tom. I think I think we're gonna win this one. You know what, if, if it was like back in the old days, 
and the club was full of local lads, you might think, okay, they might be a bit distracted by the fixture coming up on Tuesday next week. But I think for most of our players, this game, you know, it's Premier League, it's meaningful to them and and they they want to do well in it. Yeah, and also if they do badly, they know they might not play on Tuesday. You know, this is a, this is a, a, a squad now where if you play badly, you might not, you know, there's no guarantee you're going to be in the next game. If the bloke comes in and plays well, doesn't know when you're going to be back in that team. Um, and also, one of the, if we can get a win, it's a big if because Bournemouth are a really good team. One of the great things we'll have done is we'll have weathered the loss of Nathan Redmond, arguably our best player. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have weathered the loss of Nathan Redmond. And if we can win on Friday, in the four Premier League games that Nathan Redmond will have missed, we'll have won three and drawn one, which was against Man United, which is incredible, really. Um, to lose your sort of talisman, your best player, your most creative, uh, be a sort of goal threat, I'd argue, and then to still, still do that. So, you know, it would represent a real fair in the captain's saying, and it would be a home win, which, you know, people at St Mary's don't get to see too often. Um, I think it's going to be a really good, really open, positive game. Great, good, great game for Friday night under the lights, I think. Yeah, right. definitely. Should we move on to South Coast Derby Exhibit B? Yeah, I mean, this is the real one. This this is the real one. Um, Tom, just uh, you mentioned him earlier, Carl Anker, who we had on uh, last week's episode, writer for The Athletic. He's very keen to speak to any Saints fans that have been to a South Coast derby at Fratton Park. I've not, so I can't help him on that one. I don't think you have either, Tom. No, I've been to two at St Mary's, never yeah. only at Fratton Park. I think... Uh, I was going through it. I think I've been to four at St. Mary's. So, I mean, we might want to go through some of them. Um, wh- uh, where do we start with this? Do we start with kind of like current teams and current form? or I mean, that just doesn't really matter. Should we just start talking about the history of Southampton Portsmouth, Tom? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, this is one of those rivalries. It makes me laugh. And I guess in the era of TV, they'll always like, you know, the North London Derby, it's like, wow, well, big deal. You know, play each other twice a year. Merseyside Derby, big deal, play each other twice a year. This is a real derby, John, because this is years, isn't it? What was the last one, like 2011? Yeah. 2012? I mean, it just doesn't years happen of often anger. enough, does it? Yeah, that's what makes it special, isn't it? That's what I mean, like Merseyside Derby, like this is, you know, they get to grind out this animosity at least twice a year. This is a real derby of real... Um, sort of, you know, real visceral. Um, I don't want to use sort of hatred, but real visceral sort of feelings. And and also, it's you know what's great. Almost like the mismatched but, um, nature of the team makes this a really interesting game because if you're if you're a Portsmouth player, this is your chance. To do. I mean, I hate when you know inverted commas big teams say stuff like this, but you go down in history, you win this game. Oh yeah, I mean that there there is potentially a legend in the making. I mean, what, should, should we start with maybe the games that that we've gone to, Tom, and then we can talk about how important those kind of goals were for the players involved. I mean, the, the last South Coast derby that I was um, at, uh, <clears throat> I think was probably, well, it would have been the one in the championship on our way back up. It's back in 2012. Um, but actually, let, let's talk about the ones that we've won. I think probably the the most memorable one for me was my first one, which was 2003 Southampton versus Portsmouth in the League Cup and James Beatty scoring two goals. Oh, yeah. And was that when he did his cupping his ear to the Pompey fans? I think it was, yeah. When he wound up the uh, wound up something good and proper. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, yeah. great. First half goal, and then um, I think it was like a last minute penalty as well, wasn't it? Just to finish it off and yeah. quieten them, and you know, the joy of seeing the likes of you know, Steve Stone and Teddy Sheringham and Yakubu looking all kind of dejected, and I suppose Matt Taylor as well, probably the, the one that I most enjoyed seeing dejected at the end of that. I mean, that was. <laughs> That was just wonderful, you know, just because it was like my first one was just brilliant. Oh, and, and of course, um, Portsmouth had a player sent off as well, which is, you know, extra brilliant, fun stuff. Because yeah. that's what Greg said, because then you win the penalty, but then the red card comes out and you get the cheer, which yeah. is always a great sort of 
Bye Bye Cheer. Oh, yeah, I'm just looking at those. Arjan Dejou, which is a great name. But... Great name, but clearly, you know, not not a lovely chap if uh, he's played for that lot down the road. Um, next one, which I went to, uh, I remember for one thing, and that was Marion Parha's sublime goal, which I think, I think this game we won 3 0, and it was kind of like the Brett Ormerod, James Beatty. Um, you know, Pahas was a, more of a, a, a side show at that point. I think he'd just come back from a long spell of injury and then just scored this most beautiful goal where he kind of, uh, I, I think I was in the Kingsland stand, and he kind of cut from the Kingsland towards the, the goal at the northern end and just curled it into the, the far side of the net, having taken it around a couple of players. I mean, it was a sublime bit of attacking play and it was yeah basically a bit of a rout really 3-0 against Portsmouth fantastic stuff it's a great Saints team as well anti Navy. you know yeah Pahas that's a, that's a sort of classic Strack in the Saints team wasn't yeah. it really Chrissy Marsden Linda Farman Svensson yeah. in the back David Prutton yeah. yeah all sorts of stuff to love about that yeah Jason Dodd fan of the pod yeah that's, mm. that's a great one <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely love that one. Which, which was your first Saints Pompey? So years ago, I went to the Dell with my dad uh, for a League Cup game. Um, and I, I don't know, John, if you have the list of games. No, I, I have, swear on. League Cup. FA Cup, I mean, 1996. I'm, I'm it could well have been that. What, what was the score? 3-0 to Saints, Neil Shipley and a Jim Magilton brace. Could well have been that one. I, I think, think it has it to be. Have... That was the only time we played them in the whole nineties. Oh yeah, then it'll definitely be that one. Yeah. Do you want me to read and through think... the lineup for that one, just to see did if I can and, get your did a, called, did a guy called Andy Williams come off the bench for Saints? Uh, no. The... Or was it Wayne Bridge? Wayne Bridge come off the bench? Did he? No, no. This is before Wayne oh. Bridge. Neil Madison came on for Gordon Watson, and Paul McDonald came on for Neil Heaney. I'll go through the lineup. Dave Besson. Jason Dodd, Ken Moncow, Alan Nielsen, Barry Venison, Simon Charlton, Neil Heaney, Nielsen. Jim Magilton, Littis, Shipley, and Gordon Watson. That's a, I mean, there's a lot to like there. Yeah. I was on, I was on driving near, uh, near my parents' house in Teddington. Yeah. It's a very boring story. And uh, stopped at a bus stop, to ask a guy, like, you know, straight away to his place, and there was Neil Shipley waiting for a bus. <laughs> this, would, this would have been in, like, 1999, so I don't know what he was doing, waiting for a bus, but um, that's my Neil Shipley story. But 3-0. Yeah. I mean, if we get 3-0 on Tuesday, John, we'll be happy with that. Oh, mate, yeah, I'd be delighted with that. So, I mean, you know, I'll be most happy with no injuries. It's the sort of game where you can imagine a player doing something stupid, Tom, I, you? I think you need to revise that statement. You just said you'd be most happy that in the real South Coast derby that we get no injuries. No, but, well, no, obviously, so obviously most happy with the win, but yeah. You know, it's just got one of those things that you can imagine, like someone lunging in, you know, doing someone's knee, something like that. You don't want to yeah. see that on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, could happen though. In, fr- in happen. frustration, the sort of thing that happens, stupid thing that happens. But please don't do that. Uh, Pompey players that are listening to this, which I'm sure they will laugh. Yeah. Um, so, what the, sort of team do you think he's going to play, John? Well, I hope he knows, and I hope he goes full strength. But he what? kind of went full strength against Fulham, didn't he? So why would he not do that here? Well, did, did he, though? Because I, I don't think he did go full strength against Fulham. Well, not far off it. Yeah. I mean, he went more full strength than Fulham did. But, um, you know. I mean, if you look at the Fulham game, so... Who did he have in that team? Was, that, was it Gunn or was it McCarthy? Um... Let me just get up the match report and the team lineups. So it was McCarthy. Yeah. Oh, that's not full. That's not full. That's true. No. But still, it's a damn good goalkeeper. Yeah. Swar- yeah so Suarez. He you went for Suarez yeah. McCarthy, Suarez, Suarez Bednarek, Dancer, Bednarek. Hoiberg, Hoiberg, Romeo, Romeo. Prowse, or Prowse, uh, Buffal, Gineppo, Obafemi, Rob. I think what's interesting here is that I think Danso, um Buffal, Gineppo, Obafemi, Suarez were all getting their kind of like first game of the season. We've all seen them used since. 
So even if he is bringing in players, he's bringing in players that he's thinking are important, are first team squad players, isn't he? Mm. But if you look at that, I mean, apart from McCarthy, and it takes until you get to, um, I mean, obviously Danzo was suspended against the uh, suspended against Sheffield United. You could argue definitely, yeah, he probably would have played had he not been suspended. Um, so let's go to a hypothetical world where he hadn't been sent off and he had played against Sheffield United. You know, apart from McCarthy, you have to go to Obafemi there before you've got a different player and played against Sheffield United. Yeah. I mean, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's, let's just say eight of the 11 that played in the last Premier League game played against Fulham. So hopefully Ralph will continue that. I mean, I, I, I guess probably one of the, my biggest hopes is that he does play Shea Adams because, you know, he's just come out of the championship where he's proved that he can do it. You know, the, the Pompey players are going to be closer to the sort of defences he was playing against last season. Mm. And we'll be doing the kind of dirty tricks and japes that happen down in, you know, the, the the life below the Premier League. I, I know the championship is much, much higher quality than people give it credit for. But, you know, he's he's going to know what it feels like to play at that level. And I think he'll be a big asset to Saints on Tuesday. Yeah, and also it's the sort of game where if he can nick a goal against form, you know, like if he can get that goal, no matter how he gets it, 30-yard worldie or bounces off his shin, who cares? Like he will go into that Portsmouth game and he will lead the line and he will, you know, he will want to make himself a hero. Um, I've got no doubt about that. So I, I completely agree. I think, you know, let leave the dog and war on Portsmouth and I'd just say give the whole first team a go at it because yeah. they, they just can't lose this game, John. You, you know what? I've been so blindsided by the fact we've got Portsmouth. I have even no idea who we'll be playing the weekend afterwards. I just haven't even looked at the fixtures uh, beyond that. I keep on getting stuck. Spurs. Is it, is it Spurs the next weekend? It could be. Yeah, it is coming round quite quickly. You're right, it is Spurs. Which will be a really hard game. Mm. Away at Spurs. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, we have to get a win on Friday night because the difference between Saints now and maybe Saints of a year or so ago, two years ago, is that we weren't beating Portsmouth and then we were going to Spurs and getting top. Do, do you know what I mean? And that's, mm. that's, when, that's when you're going to be in and around that bottom three. Whereas if we win against Bournemouth, we can go to Spurs and lose. Yeah. You know, like if we can. It's not like a disaster. It's just what happens to of the what, 18 games Spurs play at home, 19 games Spurs play at home this season, they'll probably win 12, 13 of them. Yeah, yeah, there's no shame in losing. What I'm saying is to do is beat the teams like your Bournemouth, like Shepherd tonight, like your Brighton. Because then, you know, if we can pick up the odd draw against Spurs, the odd draw against May United, you know, we can be set for a really exciting season. Yeah. Right. Should we do a little bit of history now then, Tom? I'm, I'm going to go, go on, way, then. way back. Right. So we're talking about kind of long, long, long time ago. I think the first ever game at Fratton Park was Southampton versus Portsmouth. We won't talk about the result, but obviously Saints, which I think were a professional established side, let, you know, Portsmouth have their kind of first game at their stadium. Uh, and um, one of the the players kind of said, oh, you know, a very fine lot, well done. That's all very nice. It was all very, very patronising. Um, but it hasn't stayed that friendly for very long. Um and I know some of the older guys that listen to this podcast are probably screaming things that they would love to to tell us or, or let the fan base know. Um, but I, I suppose one of the things which people, particularly our American listeners, might not um, know about is the whole why are Saints called scum? Why are Portsmouth called the, the skates? Um, and do we want to do a little bit of history on this? Because there's there's on, there's John, full stories. I think I know stories. why, but- Go on, I think I, I mean, the, the version I know, well, I think is true, is probably not true, so please tell us. Okay, so some uh, Portsmouth fans will tell you that uh, SCUM as, is an, an acronym for Southampton City Union Member, and that the scummers or the Southampton dockers broke a strike and crossed a picket line um, back in the 1940s, um, which has been debunked uh, many, many times. So 
the reason it's quite easy to debunk it is because obviously Portsmouth is a naval dock. Um, Southampton is a commercial dock and actually Southampton is a much more left wing city much more kind of unionised workforce and actually had strikes, whereas I don't think there's much history of any striking in Portsmouth. And I think in um, the 1980s, Portsmouth plundered Southampton's kind of cross-channel ferry business uh, during kind of industrial action. So, you know, that just just doesn't work. Um, Another reason I've heard for scum being used is that, you know, the the Navy would say the word scum because it means the stuff that always rises to the surface despite it not having any discernible qualities um i quite like that one because although obviously we know that we do have lots of discernible qualities as southampton football club the fact that we're going to rise above them and to the top I, i'm quite happy with I, I i'd quite happily settle for that yeah i mean i i was i heard the sort of the docking rumor so it's yeah. good to know that that's not true that's yeah. one i i was told was true yeah, de- definitely. You know, there's a, there's a few articles online which are worth a read, but yeah, that one's definitely not true. Um, and then the other thing which is quite interesting is that both Saints fans and Portsmouth fans used to call each other scum, um, and say it was I think a campaign from the Ugly Inside fanzine that they decided they need to have a new name uh, for the Portsmouth fans, and they actually chose a a phrase skate which is a nickname that people from Portsmouth used to give to their seafaring uh, friends so if you were kind of like a land loving Portsmouth folk um, you would take the mickey out of sailors and navy men and call them skates because of what they might do on lonely nights whilst they're out at sea with certain winged fish um and so it was kind of like a way, well, let's adopt that word that they use as a horrible insult towards their own and then use it to you know, cover them all in, in that term. So so that's where that one comes from. Interesting. So so basically, I mean, I don't know if there are any sorts of podcasts. They're probably doing this exact same thing, aren't they? And they're probably putting the blame on us and they're, we're putting the blame on them. And essentially... Like our children, when they do their podcast about saints, do this, their children will do it, and so on and so on, and hopefully this continues forever. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great. I mean, I'm so excited. If you could see me, Tom, I'm <laughs> sat here just with a big grin on my face because it's so it's so exciting, isn't it? It is. And John, where are you going to be watching the game? Um, just at home, I'm afraid. There's there's not that many options in the village of Horrorbridge in Dartmoor in West Devon. <laughs> Well, any um, any uh, Saints fans in London that are listening that will want to watch the game, uh, I think a few of the London Saints fans are meeting up in Sports Bar and Grill near Old Street on Tuesday evening. So if they want to come along, um, uh, just please do meet us there. Great. So Sports Bar and Grill, Tuesday night, if you're a Saints fan that's been exiled to London, should be a fairly good atmosphere. Um, yeah, near Old Street. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, re- relatively central as well. Um, here's quite a, an interesting one. So, um, back in 1984, uh, the clubs met at Fretton Park in the fourth round of the FA Cup. Laurie McMenemy Southampton um, won with a last-minute Steve Moran goal. And I think if you speak to the oh, older Saints fans, this is the one that they really remember and really kind of yeah, this savor. Is, this is limp, isn't it, this one? Yeah. Um, and... I, what I think is quite funny is they, they won this um, game in injury time, which came from time added on after Mark Dennis was struck by a coin. And Danny Wallace... My dad, my dad used to talk about Mark Dennis, said he was the hardest player. Yeah. You know, in that same team, and full of quite hard people like Jimmy Case and players like that. And, and here's another thing. So Danny Wallace and Ruben Agbula also subjected to racist abuse throughout the game, had bananas thrown at them. It was a dark time, wasn't it, John? Yeah, 1980s. And um, this is the thing which I think is just so sweet, is that Laurie McMenemy in the after-match interview said, we're in the fifth round, we've picked up £4.50 in loose change and two pounds of bananas. <laughs> you know, what a way to stick it in. He's such a class act, Laurie. Yeah. 84 years old, what a class act that man is. Uh, my dad, when he was a kid, um, at the Dell, he gets the Dell really early, 
and apparently because obviously there was nothing that happened before games my dad used to say that they sort of you'd get to the Dell and as soon as it opened which was at like I don't know like 12 o'clock I think like three hours before kickoff, and you'd go and they'd just go and sit there and just look at the pitch because in those days like there was no pre-match entertainment there was no music and the players used to like come and warm up at like 10 to 3 and then you know that was it like 10 minutes I'd sort of jog half after around the pitch and then move on and then play the game. My dad, one time, um, with a mate of his, um, snuck into the sort of players area of the Dell and was sort of walking around and uh, opened the door. And Lauren McMenemy was there. And Lauren McMenemy was obviously, for so people who have never seen him in the flesh, he's huge. He's like six foot three. He's an ex, um, ex like, uh, where the Bearskins at um, Buckingham Palace, he's an ex like guardsman. And uh, he sort of said, well, what are you doing? Like, you know, I'm in fear, are you? And you, know, you best go on your way then. And they're like, yes, Mr. McMenemy. And they ran off. <laughs> uh, and they got back on. But apparently he was really, really nice about it. But yeah, he's, terrible, but he's a huge man. I mean, if you, I don't know if you've seen him, he's got hands like spades. Yeah. He's a giant. He's an absolute mountain yeah. of a man, isn't he? He's um, still, and he still is in his 80s. Yeah. Um, proper, proper Southampton legend. And, you know, not just for that. 1976 FA Cup final win, but you know that very important win against Portsmouth in 1984. Ralph, this is your chance. I know you listen to the podcast. Go down in history, be the absolute legend that you can. This is it. This this is so important, Tom, isn't it? Yeah, this is the big one. And if you if you're a Saints fan, you've never seen that Steve Moran goal. Uh, go on on YouTube and find it because the reaction of the Saints fans behind the goal is just something. Like you just would never. That sort of a bygone era of reaction is they go absolutely insane. It's really worth watching. Yeah. Um, so Tom, I, I think we've probably got to the to the end of the podcast now. Um, and I suppose my message for the two thousand fans um, who are going to the game, those of you that are listening to this podcast, get there, make as much noise as you can throughout the whole game. Make sure the players understand exactly how important this is, and and just that they leave absolutely everything on the pitch. This is this is so big, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, you can't stress this enough. I mean, this is your chance to go down at, in history amongst Saints fans, um, you know, to, to be really remembered for something and to sort of transcend the generations of Saints fans. You know, Saints fans will never forget Steve Moran. And if your player pops up and scores the winner against Pompey or adds the fifth goal in a 5 nil thrashing, you're never going to be forgotten either, so don't miss this chance. Right. I think on that note, Tom, we should say ta-ta. Ta-ta. <laughs>